The largest fanged beast seen in the series thus far, Gamoth is a true giant, and a solid contender for largest apex, outweighing many higher ranked monsters in its role as Queen of the Tundra. The largest herbivore seen in the series so far too, Gamoth has a challenge surviving in the sparse northern latitudes. So let's explore the final member of the Fated Four. One of the most noticeable things that may get many wondering about Gamoth is her huge coat of fur. This is what we'd expect in a big polar mammoth. But if this is the case, then why are her carnivorous contemporaries so bare in comparison? Especially when Gamoth is so big and should thus be most able to utilize gigantothermy. To start with, one factor may be the availability of shelter. We know Barioth dig their snow dens, and Tigrex will utilize caves to avoid the worst of the weather. And indeed, Giganox is a cave wyvern. Such structures will be a good deal warmer than the outside. They'll have fairly stable temperatures, as well as being more humid, with no wind chill. These are all luxuries Gamoth's huge size denies it, and we see it has to weather any and all external conditions with no real alternative. It's a very different proposition to spend a few hours out in the calm daytime when you're mainly moving to, to spending a 24 hour winter solstice night in a polar blizzard wind chill with no respite. We see in the generation's opening that Tigrex will shelter from blizzards in caves, whereas Gamoth has no choice but to tank them. Other mammal species like Blangonga and Lagombi are considerably smaller, as well as being less likely to utilize caves due to the risk of bumping into the wyverns, so their superb coats keep them insulated instead. Said coat may be Gamoth's only real level of protection too, and whilst polar animals are associated with a considerable layer of blubber, this is much more prevalent in marine or hibernating animals or both, like polar bears. For terrestrial animals that don't hibernate, too much fat can impede mobility, and so Gamoth relies chiefly on a coat instead. On top of this, bodily position can also factor into this too. An animal's stance can significantly affect how much heat it keeps or loses, and it does seem Gamoth sleeps standing up rather than hunkering down and reducing surface area. Again, having to do this for hours in sub-zero blizzards may result in a level of cold that would readily kill uninsulated mountain wyverns, even if they try to curl up, and so they can only be bested with a good coat or a good layer of fat. Standing does also burn more energy than bedding down too, but Gamoth may well just adjust its metabolism to reduce food intake so it's not just burning all its energy keeping warm when basal metabolic processes and the cost of standing can keep it warm for the most part when resting too, when combined with the insulation. Overall, metabolic control and seasonal adjustment may just be big parts of how Gamoth stays warm and cool in the varying seasons. As it's worth noting the snowy mountains as we know them from the playable map are still in their temperate summer or spring season, and not the winter when the area becomes untraversable. Gamoth may well shed, and we just see them in their leftover winter coats, either preparing for winter or prior to shedding. On top of this, food may actually be another factor too. In the snowpack, Gamoth will either browse trees or forage for plants and fungi beneath the snow. Needless to say, this food will be very cool, at freezing temperatures or just higher. And Gamoth eats a lot of it. Like a musk oxen or elephant in the colder periods, Gamoth likely has a lot of low quality forage with a long retention period. Considering the digestive system being in the core of the body where it's vital to keep a constant temperature, for both itself and the microbes that will be assisting it in breaking down plant matter, as Gamoth is very likely a hindgut fermenter, Gamoth will be packing in a lot of cold food into its core so it may well need considerable insulation to allow itself to cope with this need to keep warming food. Compare this to carnivores like Tigrex and Barioth. Barioth as an organ and fat specialist dives right into its fresh kills for the core of the body, literally the hottest food available in the tundra. Tigrex is less picky and will also consume bone and muscle, but feeding from a fresh kill will likely still be a lot better than frozen bark and mushrooms. Tigrex's ability to spike its own metabolism may also be a feeding adaptation as much as anything else, and a method to bring frozen carcasses it's appropriated or dug out from the snow up to core temperature in its stomach. As animals of barren tundras and steppes too, Gamoth may also be used to arid areas with little water, and taking on comparatively little drinking water too. 
especially in winter periods when the process of eating snow and ice for hydration is one of the most energetically costly processes to warm it to core temperature. As a mixed feeder, Gamoth may burn some energy by moving whilst feeding, but not enough to really make a difference considering potential patch quality, step length and the reach of the trunk. So Gamoth also likely can't rely on additional heat from the muscles to help out with warming itself internally too. All this insulation is made possible chiefly by Gamoth's incredible pelage. Gamoth's coat likely consists of two or three layers, normally the tough outer guard hairs and the softer woolly under hairs, with some animals also having additional guard hairs in a third layer too. Gamoth's coat is described as very resilient to physical damage, and capable of absorbing harsh blows, presumably from the density of the inner wool and the toughness of the outer guard hairs combined. On top of this, the fur is also likely heavily oiled. Like a woolly mammoth, Gamoth presumably also has sebaceous glands in the skin that secrete various oils into the fur to reinforce and waterproof it. This may be one of the reasons for the trunk spines Gamoth has too. The trunk may be an important part for both grooming the fur and keeping it clean, as well as spreading the oil through the fur and as deep into the underlayers as it can go. Whilst the oils are likely excreted over much of the body to waterproof much of the pelt, Gamoth may take particular care to oil its front quarters as this is the half of the body that actually acts as the snowplow. If musk oxen are anything to compare by, a Gamoth calf may also need not worry too much about the cold either, with juvenile animals having cold resistance on par with adults from their coats and brown fat. Born small, white and fluffy, in terms of softness, warmth and flawlessness, the pelt of a Gamoth calf may have no equal, and easily outstrip other snowy animals like Barioth, Blangonga and Lagombi. It may be both the presumed taboo of killing a Gamoth calf that prevents them ever being worn, as well as the certain hell that a mother Gamoth would bring to those that hunted the calf. Compared to its titanic mother, a Gamoth calf is born very small indeed, barely the size of a rhino if that. And this huge size disparity may well come from the huge size of the adult gamoth. At that size, if it tried to have a calf more in line with a typical elephant, the strain on the mother of carrying around such a burden as well as supplying enough protein for the both of them would be too much. Once sauropod levels are reached, typically, eggs are the vastly superior method of reproduction. But like other polar herbivores, gamoth mothers will probably still try to give their calves the biggest head start in life they can, and put considerable investment in utero, so the young are born with considerable brown fat reserves and are ready for swift growth. Gamoth calves may also be weaned fairly quickly, and if the white fur is camouflaged, then they're presumably born in winter. The first few months of their life are likely spent with their mother suckling energy-rich milk, growing quickly and putting on fat before being weaned in time for the boreal plants to be at their maximum nutritional level, at which point the calf starts to bulk feed on them to make sure lean growth increases instead. Gamoth, especially the females that have had calves, are famously intolerant of tigrex and can be seen to enter hostile interactions with them. And this may stem from past encounters as well as general hostility to threats. Elephants are capable of putting people in subcategories based on past experiences with them, and having different behavioural responses depending on the context and said experiences. So Gamoth hostility might not just be to Tigrex, but especially to individual Tigrex Gamoth are capable of recognising from scent that have either successfully predated or attempted to predate calves, adult Gamoth, or Popo individuals that the Gamoth knows. On top of this, elephants are also capable of knowledge of the individuality of others and third-party relationships. So Gamoth may not just be reacting to Tigrex for their past victims, but have an understanding that Tigrex in the vicinity present a threat to their popo and slash or calves, even if not themselves. With plentiful boreal predators, it does seem odd that Tigrex and Gamoth have such a pronounced relationship compared to everything else. Whilst the cave wyverns can be explained by Gamoth generally not entering caves, presumably even as calves too, with bird wyverns, mammals like Blangonga and other wyverns like Barioth, they all seem like they could take a Gamoth calf. It could be a behavioural difference that leads to the risk of predation. Tigrex is famously brash in a way its conspecific predators aren't and the threat of an adult gamoth nearby could dissuade other predators from attack. 
A single hostile protector is known to be able to end attempted predation before it begins, and so Gamoth presence could prevent all but the most brazen predators. Exceptionally hungry predators may still give it a shot, and in circumstances where an adult isn't present, younger animals may well be fair game. But for the most part, Gamoth may be left to Tigrex. As a food-following nomad too, Tigrex may be less discerning with its food as it has less choice in where to forage. Barioth may have a set territory with multiple popo herds it can select from, whereas Tigrex may have no choice but to follow the popo herds it finds and whatever else may be accompanying them. Gamoth have the interesting behavioural quirk of leaving their calves in popo herds. This is similar in a way to crushing where individuals leave multiple young together from separate mothers, and it's seen in some large herbivores like giraffes, who will leave their calves with one female whilst the other mothers go off to forage. Whilst Popo aren't Gamoth, they do seem to be the closest relative to Gamoth seen thus far in game, and are also proboscideans or proboscidean analogues, and there may be enough taxonomic closeness and shared body language or other forms of communication, that Gamoth can leave their calves here in a similar way to a crash. It may seem odd to leave a calf with the preferred prey of many mountain predators, but there could be a good reason for this. Whilst Gamoth are presumably mixed feeders and popo grazers, Gamoth may go to browse when they leave the calves in the herds. The wooded environment may be too much of a high-risk area for stalking predators for Gamoth to bring their calves out. Similarly, even if they're in a herd of popo, having lots of popo around significantly dilutes the risk to the individual calf itself. If with its solitary mother, a calf is the only realistic target for any predator. Terrain may also play a factor too, and the little legs of the calf may make following the mother to certain feeding locations untenable, time and effort-wise as well as the risk of snowdrifts too deep for a calf to cross, even if following in its mother's path. The cost of the calf being born in winter and weaned by the time of the good grazing and browsing may be the mother's having to adopt the crash system. But then the follow-up is, why don't Gamoth themselves just form herds? Why rely on Popo instead of other Gamoth and use them to crash calves with? In fact, why are Gamoth seemingly solitary animals when this seems unusual for their inspiration? Well, for a start, it's worth pointing out we don't actually know very much about Gamoth, and especially not their sociality. Their appearances in the series is a sample size of all of n equals 2, with only a few canon quests actually involving them or Elderfrost individuals. There can be a lot that changes seasonally and slash or with the individual. With that said, it could also be a mix of environment and Gamoth size. Unlike some other regions in the series, the boreal habitats don't seem that much more productive than ours. But despite this, Gamoth is a sauropod-sized animal that feeds constantly as a hindgut fermenter, and also has to share the grazing with the much bigger herds of Popo too. In short, Gamoth may be too large and demanding for there to be herds in the boreal ecosystems. But that doesn't mean they can't be social. Chimpanzees will live in groups of up to 130, but all the group will almost never all be in the same space at one time. Rather, they use fission fusion sociality, splitting into small groups that mix and match. If all 130 were together, they'd drain their resources in such a large patch of forest, they then wouldn't have sufficient time to make it enough distance to an undrained patch without losing condition. So instead they function as smaller roving groups over a large area that are less taxing on the environment. Gamoth may be similar but save the fusion events for certain places and certain times of year. Elephants also use fission fusion sociality, and in forest elephants, fusion events are saved for social arenas. Large clearings in the forest where multiple herds come to socialise for brief periods. Information is exchanged in these arenas, and social bonds are made and maintained, helping them strengthen elephant society. Gamoth may be similar in this regard, with multiple animals coming together in the summers and general warmer periods in similar social arenas to introduce new calves, renew social bonds, and exchange ecological information. So whilst Gamoth may be seemingly solitary, they may still maintain a certain amount of sociality with both other Gamoth and their popo herds too. The assumption that Gamoth aren't social also assumes that Gamoth can't keep in touch when not together too, when this probably isn't the case. Elephants have considerable abilities to communicate over surprising distances of multiple kilometres through low frequency and seismic vibrations. So Gamoth too can likely still stay in touch with other Gamoth even when they're miles away. 
Considering such abilities to create amplitude and low frequencies may increase with size too, the sauropod-sized gamoth may well be significantly better at it than elephants, and be able to communicate over vastly greater distances. Elephants can also detect subtle differences in the acoustic cues that allow them to tell apart different herd members, but also to pick up on the other cues in their environment too. Gamoth can almost certainly pick up on the footfalls and calls of other giant monsters and react accordingly, plan routes around avalanches and other seismic movements when they're still miles away, or detect the barrel bombs and other weapons of hunters too. So overall, they're very likely in touch with their environment through sound. As Proboscideans too, Popo are likely in the same boat. Whilst Popo aren't as able to produce sounds at the same level, they can still likely pick up on the sounds Gamoth put out and vice versa. So herds and individual Gamoth can also keep in touch with each other's whereabouts, and react accordingly depending on the scenario. With the knowledge that Tigrex also influence Popo movements as a considerable push factor, and that Tigrex also have deafening calls probably more detectable than any other large monster, Popo may have to juggle a lot of different information points with the safety of Gamoth, the threat of Tigrex, and then the choice between high and low risk areas and which the other monsters prefer, and be located in as to how they then make their own movements. Like elephants, the vast differences in Popo and Gamoth, despite them being the same family, likely stem from their different approaches to resource acquisition and predator defense, and then the resultant ecological impacts that they had on their sociality. Popo herds are partially driven by herd defense of young and each other from smaller predators, and increased vigilance against larger ones. Their smaller size necessitates group living, but also allows them to actually live in groups permanently, and to change group sizes depending on the circumstance. On the other hand, Gamoth's huge size makes it essentially an invulnerable animal, but at the cost that it's such an expensive lifestyle in such a barren environment that they typically live alone. Whilst Gamoth may find ways to communicate either over long distances or for temporary meetings, they're simply too costly to live in permanent herds. It's unknown if there are more proboscideans in the world of Monster Hunter. In our own, they were once a widespread and diverse family, now limited to just a handful of successful survivors after the Pleistocene. Whether this is the case in Monster Hunter, or if there are more elephants and elephant-like animals to be seen in future, remains to be seen. This more solitary lifestyle could also limit Gamoth's environmental impacts to an extent too. The actual impact of elephants of clearing trees and opening up forested areas has been contested in the literature, with impacts found more likely being positive, and not the negative habitat homogeneity that some have insisted on in the past. Some studies have also found even if elephants don't transform pre-existing areas, they may halt or slow bush encroachment in already open savannas. So whilst Gamoth is a huge animal, their comparative infrequency in the landscape may mean they don't have significant or sweeping changes across it, compared to smaller and slash or more numerous animals, likely in more productive habitats. Gamoth can still have important impacts in its own way. It can still be a considerable seed disperser across the boreal lands, and many plant species may depend on it in this way. So whilst Gamoth may not have created an equivalent Gamoth step, in our own world the Mammoth step is more believed to have been made by climate conditions at the time, rather than the actions of giant herbivores like Mammoths. If there was an Ice Age in the recent past of Monster Hunter, see Devil Joe and Blangonga's video for more on that, then Gamoth may have undergone changes in range it couldn't do really much to hold. Gamoth can also have other impacts through their relationships with Popo too. In Durambaros's video, it was mentioned how its ability to ignore any landscape of fear means it can transport nutrients from high-risk areas to low-risk ones, and keep such areas enriched with dung. Not only may Gamoth do this, but may exponentially increase its impact by extending this privilege to Popo by protecting them. Under the watchful eyes, or rather ears and nose, of Gamoth, large numbers of Popo can potentially utilize high-risk areas safely, and cultivate them in ways just a single Gamoth may not be able to, regardless of size. So with this, what exactly is Gamoth eating? Mammoths themselves were chiefly grazers, feasting mainly on the rich grasses and related graminoids of the mammoth steppe. Whilst Gamoth may be similar at some times of the year and in some parts of its range, in some ways, Gamoth may be more like a modern African elephant, with a significant diet switch with the seasons, 
Depending on their range, modern elephants will often be chiefly grazers in the wet season, when the grazing is good, and then swap to chiefly browsing in the dry season when grasses become nutritionally poor with the exception of the roots. With the most frequent ecosystems the boreal habitats of monster hunter seem to feature, which is more semi-open winter forests than steppes and tundras, this may be more likely for gamoth. There may be sufficient clearings and grazing for them in the summer to eat like a mammoth, and possibly even come together in temporary social groups. But come the winters, the nutrient-poor graze may not be enough, especially with such resources also being better utilised by Popo, and so Gamoth turn to mainly being browsers. An unusual food item Gamoth indulges in is fungi. While such food is rare in the diet of modern and extinct proboscideans, the size and prevalence of fungi in the monster hunter world likely prompted this shift. After all, other herbivores will often eat them for the protein boosts and good calories, and with their frequency in northern environs and their seeming ability to stay good even under layers of snow, it's no surprise Gamoth regularly indulge in mushroom hunting that in the winters may be a fair chunk of their diet too. For a varied diet, Gamoth has considerable tools at its disposal to help it forage, and one of them are its tusks. Whilst they presumably originated as intraspecific weapons from Gamoth's more social evolutionary days, and may still have some function in that department for high-ranking individuals to assert dominance over younger or foreign ones, their chief use may be in foraging. Like mammoths, the curve of the tusk helps sweep away large amounts of snow, so Gamoth can access the still good forage underneath. In mammoth tusks, this leaves considerable wear marks on the tusk from decades of snow sweeping. So it's interesting that in comparison, the tips of a gamoth tusk seem all chipped and worn as well. This may come from a diet of more trees than mainly grazing mammoths, and gamoth potentially using them to ram them down. Or gamoth may clear snow and ice more with pushing motions than sweeping. It could also be the greater fungal aspects of gamoth's diet too. Their tusk tips may be important levers to lift logs, rocks and icy soil to access fungi within causing considerable wear on the tips as much as the bottom. Gamoth's headplate may be a similar tool, a mix of intraspecific armour to protect the head in shoving and wrestling matches, but also for pushing over trees and moving snowdrifts and ice blocks in the midwinters. If well supplied with blood vessels like other bones and bony protrusions, then this could serve as a thermal window for Gamoth much like the horns of some sheep species and could be an important tool to keep Gamoth cool in the summer periods even after shedding, and in periods of strenuous activity too. Like the shape of a mammoth rather than a modern elephant, Gamoth has longer forelimbs and a pronounced shoulder hump. Whilst this may be partly fat and fur, a good portion could well be muscle or the spinal column needed for such a large and heavy head, with even females having such large and pronounced tusks. Compared to modern elephants, Gamoth in general seems to carry more weight up front, and so this shows in the morphology, with the lengthened forelimbs possibly being even more pronounced than in mammoths too. Similarly, the different environments may play a role as well, and Gamoth may have more pronounced forequarters to help push through ice and snowdrifts, as well as for increased browse and fungal foraging requiring the extra power. Finally, a question many may have, as with other members of the Fated Four, is what do Gamoth of the opposite sex look like? And unlike the other members, there's been nothing mentioned lore-wise on what Gamoth bulls are like. But we can make some tentative suggestions. One that they may be larger and have larger tusks. Proboscideans are a lot like other mammals and males are larger due to sexual selection. Considering the costs and limits on the size of offspring and reproduction in general may limit a female gamoth size, the large mother hypothesis isn't likely to apply here, and so bulls may well be able to get bigger and have bigger weaponry in their tusks. The added testosterone may also make them darker too, especially if they want to show that off. And so gamoth bulls may be more black and red, or possibly even all black. On the subject of colour, it's hard to say why gamoth is so colourful. Colour in mammals is most often for concealment of both predator and prey, and in some cases the opposite of aposmatism. While Scamoth calves are white for the former reason, and it's unknown what age they change at, and if they go straight into adult colours or have a phase of popo brown as well, adult Gamoth are simply too large to need to conceal themselves, 
and their size will be a far greater threat and noticeable first over aposematism. So gamoth colour is likely for intraspecific communication. Although it's hard to suggest the messages being communicated with this colour. Many mammals that have ornate patterns or colours are very poorly understood themselves as to why they have such patterns. But whatever it is, it's likely an important signal for gamoth. On the subject of testosterone, it could be possible that they may go into muths. Analysis of mammoth tusks shows they underwent muths just like modern elephants, and true elephantids likely all did. So there may well be the chance of a sauropod-sized elephant in a hormonal death rage. This could be one reason why gamoth males aren't hunted. So for my thoughts on gamoth, she may be my favourite member of the Fated Four. But it also can't be denied she probably also needs the most work. And a lot of it. Even if we exclude the fact she didn't get a 5th gen update, there's no denying her fight was a bit of a joke. Stand by the hind legs and hit them… that's literally it. To start off, just a simple hind leg kick, tail swipe and slash or reverse would already do a lot to make her fight a lot less cheesable especially if said moves could be combined into her repositioning. On top of that, having her back legs be armoured, either in actual scutes or with compacted snow or ice, could just be another idea to stop people just aiming for her hindquarters constantly. But I also just don't think Gamoth is a monster the B team ever should have made. She feels very poorly realised in the game of her creation. In fact, maybe the most poorly realised monster to date. She's huge and slow, and portable team do much better with quick and aggressive. But with that said, Gamoth could still be made a little faster and more flexible. To watch how modern elephants attack people, they often kneel down to crush them with the head. And I think having Gamoth kneel down for some head, trunk and tusk based attacks would make her more mobile, and partially negate the issue of her head being so hard to hit otherwise, whilst also making it more of a two-way fight rather than you just hitting Gamoth while she winds up an attack for the spot she was standing in 10 minutes ago. But above all else, Gamoth does direly need a map made for her. Or at least one she can properly interact with, possibly more so than any other monster. Gamoth barely even felt like she fit in the zones of Generations and Generations Ultimate, let alone the fact she had nothing to do with them. For a start, an open map of actual Tundra would be nice to give her room to actually manoeuvre rather than her being squashed into airlocked zones or even 5th gen's open corridors. Something like having her pick up fir trees in her trunk to either throw or swing against the hunter would also be good to give her an attack with a lot of reach. I also think it would really sell Gamoth as something hugely powerful if she could not only trigger her own environmental traps to use against the hunter, like Diablos's Fisher in the Wildspire, but also if she just shrugged off other ones in the map. The thought of Gamoth just effortlessly wading through the Hoarfrost's avalanche would paint her so well as this immovable glacier of a monster. And therein lies another worry, Gamoth's power. Gamoth has the size and speed of something like Eukonloss or a Cantor, but we're told her physical equal is a soapy little wet rat. And I don't think very many people buy that anymore. Gamoth is perhaps the president of the club of monsters that are so clearly above other apexes in physical power that Capcom refuse to actually do anything with because they don't blow up ecosystems with their edginess. And this is really limiting them. As such a huge, slow and impressive monster, Gamoth isn't going to feel like it truly lives up to its potential until her strength is fully and properly embraced in both fight and ecology. And it doesn't really feel like Capcom want to do this because god forbid anyone else muscles in on their fan favourites. Overall, I am excited to see Gamoth again, and I have some hope she'll return in 6th gen, but I also can't deny I'm somewhat apprehensive about it. Gamoth will need a lot of attention to make her work really well, and I'm unsure she's enough of a favourite with the developers for that to happen. But with that said, there's still a lot to unironically like about Gamoth too. The theme is nice, the gear is nice, even the lore is nice with Popo and Tigrex and everything. But above all else, Gamoth just feels very different to many of the monsters. Giant herbivores, or in fact herbivore monsters in general, are always a breath of fresh air, as are mammalian monsters that aren't primates. While Gamoth's fight skeleton synergy still needs some work, a giant elephant monster just feels distinctly unique, while still being fitting for the Monster Hunter world. I also think it's worth noting Gamoth males have possibly the most potential of any of the fated four of the opposite sex being a fightable monster in-game. The potential of a bull Gamoth being larger and slash or larger tusked 
having a muff state or other unknown abilities all make it a pretty ripe prospect to be developed further, and in a new variant of Gamoth. So, as with the rest of the Fated Four, it seems I had a lot to say on Gamoth. Thanks for watching. And once again, thanks to all the patrons. Especially Venomenon, The Superis Duper, Sonum Lobsang, K Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steini, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Inventory Overflow, Tristan Berry, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaser, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bakohatsu Bakamatsu for their ongoing support keeping the channel going. A link is provided in the description if you want to join up, and any amount is always appreciated. Thanks as ever to Carmen Rider Moten's typically great work, creating both digital artwork and getting screenshots for anatomical close-ups, to greatly embellish these videos. Links to all their social media is provided for more artwork not seen in my videos. Thanks too to I Am The Kaiju King, for both their Gamoth Skull and the excellent Gamoth Age chart they made some time ago. For more skulls, original content, and additional artwork, be sure to check out their Tumblr for more, and support them on Patreon if you can. And if you haven't already, subscribe to T-Common Shark for more of the ethology shorts seen in the video. To address some comments from last time too, quite a few mentioned that Great Jagras eating the normal Jagras could be the dominant male eating female-like sneaker males in his harem. And this isn't a bad theory at all. Green Iguana are the species this is perhaps most prevalent in, and the Great Jagras's chief inspiration. Whilst I was trying to avoid such topics from the drone video again in the Thief Wyvern video, I do believe it could easily still be the case. I also don't necessarily believe Great Jagras needs deeper reasons for cannibalism than just hunger. As said, it's a pretty normalised behaviour, but there's nothing wrong with the headcanon adding more depth to it. Similarly, like the drone video, some suggested more feminine and slash or sneaker males as an explanation for Jagras in Rise's maps, or that they were escaped invasive species, which is probably more thought than the developers used putting them there. A few also inquired about Shamos and the lack of a great Shamos. In the drone video comments, Kemi mentioned something I essentially ascribe to as well, that the Coral Highlands have insufficient large prey for a great to be needed. Whilst it is a biomass-rich environment, it isn't in a way that favours large terrestrial vertebrate predators. It would be cool to see the design of a great Shamos and how its fight may differ, but that can be saved for a new environment in a return to the new world, if at all. And as for next time...